how do you systematize a business to a point where it's just like on a conveyor belt, right? And this goes back to our one thing we just talked about is one of those things is hiring great people. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me today, I'm excited to have Max Sharkansky. Max, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fantastic. Hey, Max, why don't you tell me something about, you know, what you, like one thing about what gets you going every day to do this business that, that you own, and then we'll dive into your business. Well, what gets me going every day literally every day is a workout. So I think, you know, sound, sound body, sound mind health mm. definitely comes first. There's n nothing more important than your health. So that's the first thing you got to do in the morning, uh, get some sort of exercise in. And then in terms of the business, I would say growth, you know, it's just, there's nothing more exciting than more growth. And we started out Back in 05, 06, with just a few build. Well, we started out with a 12 unit building, then a 30, 40 unit building, and then we bought a 40 and an 80. We sold a couple, flipped them, and like everybody else, you start out super small in your own backyard. And now we're in seven states, working on an eight state. Uh, we've got a little under 5,000 units in portfolio with another 2,500 in contract. So we'll be at 7,500 units in the next few months. And Damn. it's that growth that's so exciting. Yeah, that that's definitely exciting to be able to see that growth happening. We're at a smaller scale than you, but we're at you know kind of that similar growth, and it's just so exciting to and it's fun just to be a part of that. Uh, and it gets you, it that in itself gets you motivated to go every single day when you see that growth. Um, let me. I'm, I'm going to introduce you because I didn't do that yet, but I want to talk. Don't let me forget. I want to talk about that growth and, um, you know, just kind of how we're, how we're projecting into that. So anyways, a little bit about Max. He's the co-founder, ma managing partner, and oversees all aspects of acquisitions, dispositions, and property analysis for Tryon Properties. And since the firm's founding, as Max said, in 2005, he's led the uh, acquisition, renovation, and disposition of more than a billion dollars in uh, value-add multifamily uh, and yielding a return in excess of over 25%. So, so a lot of success, uh, a lot of acquisition and disposition of, uh, of, of properties, and as you said, you know, you guys have grown substantially up to 5,000 units we expected, you know, well before the end of the year to have over 7,500 units. So uh, very impressive growth. I got a lot of questions. So, but the, the first question I've got, since we already were talking about the growth and we're talking about the excitement, you know, you get excited when you wake up, um, you get that workout in, but you're excited because you've, you're seeing that growth, you're feeling that growth. But a lot of my listeners right now uh, and people I, I mentor, pe people I talk to are frustrated because they're not seeing the growth. They're, they're pounding their head against the pavement because they're putting in offers. They feel like they're putting in some of the reps, but they're not getting the results. And I'm sure you've been there. I know I've been there. How do you get motivated? How do you keep pushing forward when that's, you know, when, when what's when your growth right now is not happening, right? How, how do you continue to push? Well, I would say, you know, not to sound cliche, you have to be resilient because it's a numbers game, right? Yeah. It's a numbers game of a very low success rate. When I say success, I mean, in terms of actually closing on the deals that you're targeting, both our LA office, just to give you an example, both our LA and Miami offices in February, end of January, early February, we were looking at our pipeline and new year NMHC just happened. Lots of deals in the market. Uh, both offices had almost the exact same numbers, 50 deals on the board. 10 of those deals look like they might be reasonable deals that we might be able to buy. 
Yeah. And both offices wound up buying a few of those deals. So, you know, you're just not going to buy all the deals you're working on uh, because if you are, you're probably g- grossly overpaying. Yep. So, you know, you're doing something wrong. If you love every deal that you see, you're doing something wrong. If you're able to outbid every other investor in the marketplace on every single deal, you're doing something wrong. So just be patient, wait for the right pitch and hit it when you have a, the right pitch. Um, yeah. You know, getting into the weeds on you know, how to buy, just make sure you have super clean terms, make sure the brokers want to work with you. And don't forget, the brokers ultimately hold the keys to the castle. So make their lives as easy as possible. I actually started out my career as a broker when I was at Marcus, hmm. um, age 22 to 26, almost five years. And I would bring off market deals to the clients who were awesome. You know, they're, they're buyers who were the, I would consider were the best buyers, easy to work with, smooth DD, no retrades. Uh, you know, you put it under contract, two months later, you close. That's it. So that's the trick. So when you're, when you, when you mentioned best buyers, cause a lot of people want to be the best buyer, right? They, they want those off market. Everybody talks about off market deals. They want the off market deals. What are you guys doing to be the best buyers? You mentioned several things. Uh, what, what are you guys doing in particular to be the best buyers in the market? We'll do a lot of DD up front. Um, we'll get our crews out there. We're looking through some records. We're getting as comfortable with the asset as possible so that we could put up some hard money at PSA. Um, in a crazy market like this, you almost have to. Um, I know there are some deal, and it, look, it depends on the state also. Like California, you know, like LA, for example, has been a little bit cool. I've been taught, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a broker in LA, and he said, You're not seeing a lot of deals get done right now with hard money just because, you know, the market in LA isn't as hot as it is in some of the markets in the Sun Belt. But if you're playing in those super hot markets in the Sun Belt, you better get ready to put some hard money up at PSA. Unless, yeah. of course, you're just grossly overpaying. So our philosophy is we'd rather overterm than overpay. Hmm. So you know we would rather do a lot of the work on the front end and be able to put some hard money up. Yeah, and that makes sense. Uh, I, I I like that uh, that saying here. I'd rather overturn than overpay. I've never heard somebody say it like that, but that makes sense. I mean, you're going to do your due diligence. You're going to be firm about, hey, we're buying this building. We're not walking away. Because as a seller, and, and I, I even feel it right now, I'm selling. Um, I have I purchased a bunch of single family homes uh, back in 08, and I'm selling them. Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> Good timing. Uh, 08, 09, <laughs> you know, 10, you know, I bought a bunch of them and I'm selling them. But, you know, as I'm getting these offers, I'm weighing how quickly their inspection contingency expires versus I'm, it's not only am I looking at the price. It's not I'm taking the highest price. I'm taking the one that provides me the best terms because I want surety of close. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait around. I don't want this thing to go back on the market. I just want to get this thing closed and off my books. And I, I think a lot of times buyers forget that and they think it's only price. They don't think of anything else. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of the times, you know, as a seller, if you've got multiple offers and one of those offers is from a name brand buyer who has a really good reputation, but they're a little bit lower then you go and they have some hard money up. You go with that buyer. I mean, yeah. we've definitely done it. And I know for a fact that we've been awarded deals where we're not the high bidder. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You founded in 2005, 2000, you know, eight, we were in the midst of a financial crisis. It, Talk, talk me through that time for you guys. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know the story. So talk me through that time between 2005 and, and the financial crisis of 2008 and beyond. Where, where were you guys at? What, what, what was the, what was the path like? Um, that's a great question. So we bought our first couple in 05. I was a broker at Marcus. My partner, Mitch was on the debt side at HFF and we're childhood friends. Our 
company named Tryon uh, is actually Trojan and Lion because we know each other back from our college days. We didn't go to the same college, but we went to the same junior college. Hmm. He transferred to USC. I transferred to LMU. So Tryon is Trojan and Lion. And oh, that's cool. Anyway, so yeah. And we started buying in 05 and then we formed Tryon in 06. We hit the ground running with four or five properties because, um, you know, we were buying when we sold our old shops. And we aggregated a small portfolio, which we sold. We were fortunate to have good timing. We sold most of it in 08 prior to the crash. Wow. And yeah, we started to see the writing on the wall with what was happening with subprime loans, what was happening with uh, foreclosures, NODs. That was during the first wave. And we stopped buying and we started selling and we started targeting instead of buying or targeting value add multifamily, we realized we couldn't make that work. We were targeting non-performing debt secured by multifamily. So Mm. we were really going into the GFC with almost no assets and just, you know, some cash, our own cash and some of our investor cash that had been returned. So In 9, 10, 11, 12, we bought zero deals from private individuals or organizations. Everything we did during that period, we purchased from banks, um, servicers, Fannie Freddie. So we did about 20 deals during the GFC, uh, about 15 of which were non-performing notes and five of which were REOs. And then coming out of the GFC, we went back to the value add business. Interesting. Yeah. What what a great time to, to to be buying and positioned to be able to buy. So you know, obviously congratulations for being able to get uh, out of those properties and sold and made some profit versus a lot of people uh, did the opposite. Um, you, you mentioned the writing on the wall. A lot of people feel like for whatever reason, there's many different reasons people feel like we are at the top of the market and there's nowhere else to go other than down. You're still buying right now. You you just told me that you have properties under contract. You're still buying. You haven't started to sell everything. Is the writing on the wall today? And if it's not, why not? And what makes today different? Well, we're doing a little bit of both. We're doing some buying, some selling. We're definitely net buyers. Um, the writing is not on the wall. I mean, it might be, but I don't see it. And... I think that, yes, you have very, very low cap rates. Um, So you might see some cap rate expansion, but there's a little bit more to the formula of real estate valuation than just the cap rate. That's one piece Mm -hmm. of it. Right. Uh, The cap rate you factor into the NOI. So, you know, as you and I were discussing prior to kicking off the podcast, Tampa and some of these other markets that have 25% rent growth, 10% 10% rent growth, 8% rent growth. If rents continue to grow at half of these rates and cap rates expand, you're still going to see ultimate increase in the valuation of the real estate. So right now, from our perspective, what you're going to be seeing over the next couple of years is a foot race between rent growth and interest rates, uh, which will ultimately affect cap rates, we think, and it will have an expansion. So if cap rates go from high threes, low fours to high fours, then that's fine. We underwrite that anyways. Um, we didn't underwrite four cap exits, four and a quarter cap exits. We didn't use debt for 85% of cost, assuming these crazy assumptions. So yep. if the deal works using conservative assumptions, then buy it. Yeah, absolutely. Over the long run, you'll make money, as you know, based on the stuff you bought in 2008. Well, that's just it. you know, And, and that's what I try to, to try to reiterate to people is as long as you, well, as long as, you don't lose it. Right. So as long as you're buying it for at least a good enough basis to where you can weather a storm, you're going to make money in the long run. That's just real estate always goes up in value. It's just not at all times. Does it go up in value? Right. Well, especially our asset class, right? Multifamily is just the king of the castle. Uh, you see a lot of real estate, like suburban shopping centers that are functionally obsolete, malls, uh, some office buildings that are functionally obsolete that might not be worth more today than they were 10 years ago. But multifamily, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find multifamily that was worth more 10 years ago than it was today. Yeah. And, and, and Tryon is purchasing properties in markets that are seeing population growth for the most part, right? 
That's what I mean, yeah, absolutely. That that's our thesis, right? We like first ring suburbs of high growth markets. That's what we've always done very, very well. And we continue to do what we have changed a little bit over the past couple of years. If we started buying in some secondary markets close to high growth markets, like for example, Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Colorado Springs, we're in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, But yeah, for the most part, you know, we're buying right now, we're in escrow on a deal in a suburb of Denver, a suburb of Miami, um, we're in a suburb of Atlanta, um, we're buying a deal in Savannah, which is a secondary market, uh, we're done buying a deal in a suburb of LA, so the suburbs work, especially now with what you're seeing with demographics, um, people are going out to the burbs even more at a faster pace. Yep. So COVID was actually great for our model. Yep. Uh, it, it accelerated that growth. So yeah, absolutely. It works. And it should work for at least the next five to 10 years you're, on a structural you're... basis. Hey, the North Star Real Estate Conference is back. It's May 2nd and 3rd. And this year, it's a bit different. We're going to be hammering in on multifamily real estate. And we're going to show you asset management, value add strategies, raising millions of dollars through syndication, and how to find those hidden gems in today's market that are just so tough to find. And one of the biggest things I'm excited to bring you is industry experts that you're gonna be able to put on your team so you can hit the ground running day one. So join us May 2nd and 3rd at the North Star Real Estate Conference. Look forward to seeing you there. You're in a market or markets that have some rent control. Are you directly affected by rent control on some of your properties? Well, we're in those markets, right? So we have to play by those rules. Yep. Um, and go ahead. Well, I just wanted, I just want to know, cause I've, I've, I i do not know if I've ever actually talked to somebody specifically that, that has been in a rent control market, at least for a long period of time. So I just wanted to kind of get your, I'm not necessarily feelings on it, uh, but get just as far as a, how is that working? Uh, what does it look like? Um, cause I think a lot of people are interested in that because rent control is a big buzzword really around the country. I mean, it's even being, it's being pushed in Tampa. It's being pushed. There's a lot of places being pushed. Now, a lot of places, it probably has no legs to go anywhere, but I think it's being pushed in many, many, many markets. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. So, <laughs> you know, what I think about it is the same thing that 99% of the people in our industry think about it. Yeah. That it's stupid. It doesn't work. It's never worked. We have a hundred years of data showing it doesn't work. People like it based on an emotion, uh, based on a sound bite. It sounds good. Rent control. You're controlling rents. Well, no, because there are a lot of unintended consequences that have proven out 100% of the time. Supply goes down. People don't move as much. You have a lot less affordable units on the market. When I say affordable, I mean market rate affordable, as in like market rate older units. 25 year old plus units, just all those things that come with rent control. Um, there's a reason that Texas and Florida of, of the big four States, you know, Texas, Florida, California, and New York, there's a reason that California and New York have significantly higher rents than at Texas and Florida. And people spend a significantly higher portion of their income. It's that's main, the main reason why, well, that's, that's one of the couple reasons why I would say also because of, um, land use regulations, it's much harder to build. So it's much harder to create supply, but you know, right. you add all those regulations and it ultimately hurts the consumer. Yeah. It's still yeah. a regulation that curbs building, right? It, it curbs creation of new units, which then forces the other units to, to be more expensive, which causes rent affordability issues. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It also, uh, causes some people to stay in their units for 25 plus years. So that unit doesn't open up, right? So you're, you know, as a general rule in rent control markets, 10 to 15% of those people, are what you would call lifers or long-term, you know, they're in there 10 plus years. So you're effectively removing those units from the market. So you've got all these, hmm. you know, if, you know, LA, let's say has a million units, then a hundred to 150,000 of those rent control units aren't being made available on an annual basis because pe- they're not turning over. So it's just, it's compounding. It's, yeah. it's compounding problems that come with rent control. And again, it doesn't work. So uh, in terms of our operations, we don't really operate 
much in the strict rent control markets. Like we're not in LA anymore. We're not in San Francisco. We're not in New York. We're in California, but in California, we're only in markets that are subject to the state rent control, which is a little bit more lax, uh, not the city rent controls, which are much more strict. Got it. So in California, that's called AB 1482. It's 5% plus CPI. So, you know, you're operating right now eight, eight to 10% annual bumps. We can live within those parameters. We can operate within those parameters uh, without having to knock on doors and try to buy people out of their units. Um, you know, you give people eight to 10% annual bumps, three years, you're up, you know, if that person does not move 25% plus, yep. that works for us. Yep. Are you essentially forcing yourself to give them those rent bumps because you kind of have to keep up with it. Cause if you don't do it one year, if you give a zero bump one year, you can't do a 16% rent bump the next year. You can only do whatever 8% or whatever it is. Right. So is it, does it kind of force you to give aggressive rent bumps just to stay, just to make sure you're staying with the market? Um, well, aggressive. I mean, I wouldn't call them aggressive, but I would say well, it's okay, but... maximum allowed. So yeah, if someone's rent is 25% below market and we're giving them 8% bump. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We're going to give a maximum bump for sure. If, yeah. if somebody is significantly below market, we're going to give them maximum bump. So if they're, but if they're, let, let's say I rent a, an apartment from you um, in California and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. renting at, you know, $1,500 a month. I don't know if that's really okay, what it is, sure. <laughs> but just a number at next year, am I getting a likely, am I getting an 8% rent bump just so I keep up with the market or does it de still depend on what's going on in the market? If you're paying me 1500 bucks a month, Mm -hmm. and market and rent market. is too oh no no no. okay so if you're paying me 1500 if you're paying us 1500 bucks a month i signed a and... brand new lease right as i had a brand new lease i signed it in 2021 brand new you charged me whatever you could charge me at that time in 2022 when my lease is expiring and i want to sign a second year are you likely in in all cases bumping me at that level or does it depend on what's going on with the economy. It depends on what's going on with the economy. So will. Okay. what will probably, so if it's a, if you're a brand new tenant at market and you're up for your renewal, then we'll probably just give you a bump based on where market is and maybe even 15, 20 bucks below that level. So if the market went up 4% and you're paying me 1500 bucks, that's, 60 bucks, we might raise you like 45 bucks. So you're not incentivized to leave. Yep. If I'm inheriting you as a tenant and you're paying 1500 bucks, but market is 2k, you're we're giving you the maximum you. allowable increase. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Cool. All right. We'll get off the, uh, the rent control, uh, conversation. Cause it just puts everyone in a bad mood. Yeah. Right. I'm now I'm getting <laughs> crabbier as we're speaking. No. Uh, cool. So, you are uh, overseeing acquisitions, dispositions, property analysis for Tryon. Let's talk about the business operations. Let's talk about how you guys have actually grown because it's not just because you've written offers and you just find deals and you're buying stuff. It's because you've operated a successful business. So let's talk about some of the key things that you guys do or you in particular are doing uh, to be successful. So give our listeners maybe three um, key pieces of advice on how to operate the business successfully. That's a great question. Um, first of all, I would say try to remove yourself from your core competency. So mm. early on in our company's existence, I was really good at acquisitions. That was my core competency. That's what I was best at, finding good deals, right? Having an eye for those deals. And as you grow, as you scale a business, any business in any industry, you have to become an exec, right? You have to be become less of what your skill is and more of a manager, more of a CEO and operate every part of the business and hire 
or I would say oversee every part of the business and hire fantastic people, uh, spend more on salaries than what you're used to spending and hire people for the long haul and let them do what they're best at and probably what you used to do. Um, and a lot of the times a business's Achilles heel is the CEO's strong suit because the CEO is staying very involved in that and it's not allowing the other people in that department to grow it. So the CEO really needs to remove themselves uh, to allow everybody else to flourish and grow and do it their way. Even the C if the CEO doesn't see eye to eye on every single detail of that way. Yeah. That, that is powerful stuff right there. And that's something that I don't know if you still struggle with or or you ever struggled with giving that up, but I still struggle with giving that up. And I think I've become a lot and a lot better. Uh, But you're right. The Achilles heel of a lot of businesses is that CEO is getting in the way and they're wanting to, they want to stay in control, right? I think entrepreneurs are just, just in, in general are, very passionate about what they do. They're good at what they do, but have a lot, a hard time giving up control and being like you said, that CEO that's really overlooking and leading and helping grow. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, I think as a young business person, a lot of the times you look at these big salaries, you get sticker shock and you say to yourself, I can't afford that. The business can't afford that. Mm. It can, a lot of the times it can, and don't look at it as an expense. Look at it like one of your real estate deals or whatever it is that you understand best that you do look at as an investment. Look at those people as an investment because you're investing into the future of the business. Yeah, right. And and you have to look at, you bring one person on that salary. What happens if you can do just, just one more deal that year? Just, just grow your business by just that little tiny bit. It doesn't take much to pay them their salary. And I don't know about you. I'm assuming I do. But for me, every time we bring somebody on, we make their salary and probably about three to five times and maybe even greater every time we bring somebody new on. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not even, yeah, you know, that extra deal or that extra 25 grand in NOI, put a four cap on that, right? Like if you get really good ops people, um, yeah. I mean, it, you and I can go on this forever, whether it's good uh, project management people who will be able to bring oh, down yeah. your costs or do it faster. Yes. If you could go from uh, 40 units a month to 20 units a month, uh, yes. it's all these different things. So if when you, and when you hire these great people, they all start to work together. And you could take a step back and it's a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah. We just hired a project it's a symphony. manager and, and it's, that's exactly, I mean, it's, you know, taking your get, like you said, just if you get four a month or eight a month and you, you can double that or even increase it by 10%, the amount of NOI growth, the amount of income growth is going to far exceed what you're paying them. And, and so you're going to get your, your investment back very quickly. So cool. Um, what's a mistake that you or your company has made and how have you guys learned from it? How can you pass it down to our listeners? Um, you haven't made any, have you? I have. Oh, okay. I have. <laughs> and it was all that long I silence. Do... That man, Max is just that good. He just hasn't made a mistake yet. <laughs> I want to give you a really good answer. I want to pick yeah. the best mistake. I want to pick the most educational mistake to your listeners. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. I would I... say, you know, a lot of one of the buzzwords you, you hear in business is, and one of the buzzwords that you hear Warren Buffett talk about a lot is conveyor belt, right? Like how do you systematize a business to a point where it's just like on a conveyor belt, right? And this goes back to our one thing we just talked about is one of those things is hiring great people, right? And each one is doing their thing so well, and it's just, it becomes a conveyor belt business, right? One of the mistakes I think that we made is getting away from our niche and our conveyor belt. And when we started buying other asset classes, um, in the beginning, it worked well because we were doing it towards the end of the GFC. We were buying 
non-performing debt on multifamily and multifamily REOs, which was our niche, right? We did great. And then multifamily being the, the strong asset class that it is, that was the first asset class that cleared the market. There was nothing left to buy by early to mid 2012. Yeah. So by mid 12, late 12, we said, hey, let's buy what's left out there. And we know retail very well, right? So we started buying retail. We know just we just knew it from like working on it as brokers and stuff like that. So we bought sure. retail and we did like a little like two year stint with it. And we did great on some deals, so so on some other deals. And we got our asses handed to us on a deal a few years ago and we lost so much money on it because it wasn't our conveyor belt business, right? It wasn't multifamily, mm -hmm. which we do so well. Multifamily, I mean, if you look at our peer group, we outperform our peer group by probably 500 to 1,000 basis points on an annual basis in, in overall returns because we do it so well. Retail, you know, we bought this property that we lost money on. We bought this weird asset on a weird corner with horrible access. And I assumed because you had, it was an, in Malibu, California. And I assumed because we had such high incomes, we'd be, over, we'd be able to overcome those few issues with the asset. And one of the main issues with asset, which the asset, which I didn't realize at the time is with retail and office, density is very important. And Malibu is effectively high income rural. It's like the Hamptons, right? You've got water on one side and mountains on the other. So yes, even though you're, one mile radius average household income is 200,000 plus, which is higher than Beverly Hills. There are no people. So it's high income rural. And we had a hard time with leasing, a hard time getting rents up. And ultimately, like I said, we just got our behinds handed to us on a silver platter and we got away from what we know best. And that's why we lost money on it. Yeah. Look, I mean, you can, you can, you will make mistakes. You can make mistakes. You can have regrets it's fine to do that but you've got to learn from it and so you know learn from max's <laughs> mistakes that he's made and stay on your conveyor belt right don't go all over the place and try to do so many things it's so easy as an entrepreneur to get caught up in what other people are doing or what might be another opportunity and you lose sight of what you're really good at and it typically is going to slow your growth. It's not going to work out for the positive. My guess is that you guys, if you had stuck solely to multifamily and stayed on your conveyor belt, would have grown more during that period of time than, than what you did. It probably took your attention away from the multifamily a little bit um, and, and of course, stunted your growth. Of course, because yeah. our platform, our organization wasn't built for these few weird assets that we had in our portfolio, right? So we're in-house operations, right? We do pro property management in-house, project management in-house. So for these commercial assets, we had to hire outside management, okay? They're calling me, tenants were calling me, so I can't run the business Yeah. or, you know, I mean, at that time that I'm spending with... Yeah outside management with these yoga studios and gym tenants who are calling me, asking me for an extra free month of rent. Just and a I have distraction. To, like, it's just such an unbelievable distraction. Yeah. Even if the deals were a 20 IRR in a way, they're kind of a loss because yeah. you just don't build on it. It's just a deal as opposed to building a business. That, that right there is the best thing you've said today. And you've said a lot of good stuff. You're just buying a deal. You're not building your business. Stop focusing on the deal. The invest, I think real estate, in my opinion, real estate investors have a hard time. They, they, you consider yourself, you consider Tryon to be a company, right? You consider yourself a business. You guys are not necessarily real estate investors. You are business owners, right? And a lot of people don't think about it that way. They think they got to get a transaction done. And that, that's, that's right. You think of it, we got to grow our business. It's a totally different mindset. And that or, is how you're yeah. going to create something mm -hmm. powerful. That's right. That's right. Or they're looking at it like, you know, they're looking at this deal, which isn't their conveyor belt deal. It's a right. little bit off. And they're like, you know, I can make some money on this. 
I can yes, make some. Maybe money. you can make some yeah. money on it, but it's a mistake to do the deal because it doesn't contribute to the high level growth of your company and your career and your yes. business. Yes. So if you're doing a deal here, a deal there, and it's there's very not, and they're not cohesive, it's just very short sighted. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, cool. All right. Let's uh, let's shift to a couple last questions before we wrap up. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, what's a favorite book that you can pass down to our listeners? A favorite book. Business, um, real estate, maybe just pleasure. I don't know. Favorite book. Um, I really enjoyed, I just finished uh, the Bob Iger autobiography. What a career that man's had. Amazing career. Um, I really liked Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm, I read that earlier this year. That was an awesome book. Um, In terms of real estate book, which I once paid $140 for when you could not buy it on Amazon, they did, they stopped making it for many, many years. The autobiography of William Zeckendorf. What Mm. just, what a force of nature, what an unbelievable human being that man was and all the things he contributed to the real estate industry in New York, LA, Denver. I mean, the guy was just unbelievable. So that was a great real estate book. Interesting. Cool. A couple I've, I've never uh, picked up and never heard of. So that's great. I appreciate that. Um, How do you like to give back? Um. I'm involved with a few charities, uh, the Jewish Federation and some other ones I give to our school. Um, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, but I've got my charities that I like and I feel strongly about and that are good for society. So awesome. I give to those. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. All right. So last question before we wrap up, Max, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Um, I would say one of them is, you know, what we just discussed is think about your career, whether you work for a company or you own a company, think about your career long-term, think big, don't think about just like making a buck on this deal or a buck on that deal and think about building the business or building your career as an individual or building your career within that organization and how to help grow that organization along with your career and just, you know, think big, always think big picture. And if something feels off, if your gut's telling you that that's not the best thing to do for yourself long-term, then you're probably right. And we all have that instinct sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Love it. So that's definitely one of them. Um, I think you hear a lot right now in education and education being over overpriced. I'm, I'm talking about college education, post high school, and it needs to be disrupted. And some of those things, you know, on the fringes may be true like you know maybe you don't go to a private school and spend 300 grand for a degree in french lit um but you do do it for a degree in finance or uh compu sci because you can make a very nice career out of that so i think education is very very important is my point yeah and don't listen to all that buzz you might hear on a podcast or somewhere in an article and you have to get an education. I mean, some of these people like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, I mean, these people, their IQ is so many planets higher than the rest of us, um, than the average person thinking about an education. And, you know, if M- Mark Zuckerberg could do it as a college dropout, maybe I can too. Well, don't forget Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates dropped out from Harvard. So they were able to get into Harvard. And these people are just extraordinarily brilliant. So I would very much recommend getting an education um you know not to get too off topic but florida you know to discuss too much on this but the state of florida our legislature recently passed a bill that created a database which you should go online and look i don't don't know the name of the url off the top of my head but there's there's a database where they've compiled the last 10 plus years of majors and incomes related to those majors so you can look up any state school in Florida, Florida State, University of Florida, FIU, and you could, so you click in 
the university, then you click in the major and it'll show you what your average incomes are. And I think that's just an amazing tool and every state should have a tool like that so that people have full transparency on what it is that they're going to major in, what it is they're spending their money on, they're leveraging their future yeah. with those student loans. They should know what kind of income they're making. Yeah. So you should check that out. You know, if you can actually, you probably, even if you're out of state in any state, you could probably use that as a barometer to figure out what kind of income you're, you're going to be making if you go to a basic state school. That's cool. That's cool. All right. And number three. Number three. Um, I would say you got to take some risks. Yeah. And that risk doesn't necessarily mean leave your company or you have to be an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Yep. Um, you have to be able to stomach that level of risk and have that risk tolerance. And most people just don't have it. You just don't have the risk tolerance to leave that job and go and do this on your own and spend, you know, eight to 20 months with no income and live off your savings. That takes a tremendous amount of intestinal fortitude and risk tolerance. Uh, but you could take some risks within your organization, take some risks with your decision-making, take some risks with where you live, right? Like just because you're from a certain town and you've been comfortable in that town your entire life, well, maybe there's more opportunity elsewhere. Maybe you should get a job in a more growing town and uh, go somewhere with more opportunity growth, more, or more career growth, and more opportunity. So you got to take some risks. Love it. Love it. Max, really appreciate all the insight you've given us today. I mean, lots of great stuff, you know, be on your conveyor belt, be, be the CEO, you know, obviously talking about the Achilles heel is, is getting in, really getting in your own way, try to, you know, be your, your own strength is, is kind of your Achilles heel as a CEO and um, man, just t tons of great information. So really appreciate you joining us on the show. How can our listeners get in touch with you and learn more about what you and try on have going on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can email me at max at tryonproperties.com. And if you'd like to invest, I can put you in touch with the correct folks on our IR team. Uh, if you'd like to go to the website, www.tryonproperties.com, T R I O N properties, plural.com. Awesome. Max, again, really appreciate it. You have a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks, Todd. You too. Really appreciate you having me on. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. But your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.